smartphones. And we're live. Okay, thank you everybody for joining today. Today we're going to be talking about The Obelisk Gate by N.K. Jemison, the second book in the Broken Earth trilogy. Thanks to everyone who's stuck with us through the Broken Earth read along. Um, I'm Chloe, this one verse, and I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm in a weird place with my channel. I don't know if I feel like doing the glitzy little intro for myself, but I would love to introduce Angela and Sophia, if you haven't met them before. Um, Angela does literature science alliance. She talks about sci-fi and fantasy um, with a focus on like explaining the principles behind some of the science. And there's Sophia from Fantasy Book Addict, a wonderful booktuber, um, reads a lot of fantasy, obviously. Like the focus, would you say on fantasy by women of color? Would you say that's your thing or not really? I know you've done um, mostly, I mostly do like adult fantasy, sometimes, occasionally, why? Yes. So that's us. Um, oh, and I had a, I had a question, right. If you, if you were an origin in this world and you could control obelisks, what gem would your uh, spinel, I don't know how you say it, what, would, what gem would it be made out of? I, I know I, nothing about yeah. gems. I know, I mean, my instinct is jade, just cause I think that, or emerald, if those mm. are options, cause they're green and I like the color green. Is there a gem that's teal? That's my favorite color. Teal, I have to think. <laughs> I don't think so. I think topaz sometimes, but sometimes topaz is like, orange yeah i think i think if you like buy the topaz it's easiest to get the orange type um yeah. teal maybe like if you got an aquamarine i thought that was yeah. a gem but yeah i, I don't know I, I, have, oh. I have no clue i have no instinct i should probably learn these things <laughs> you don't have to i'm just curious because i've been posting the gems and i have a uh, opinions well what's yours I think mine would be agate, if I'm saying that right, because I think it comes in a lot of different varieties, and I like all of them, and they're like multicolored and fun. And like in my head, every time like my spinel like phases in or phases out, lipstick malfunction. Anytime my spinel phases in or phases out, it like changes to a different variety. So I like that. Nice. I'm just googling different gems right now. <laughs> Yeah, Shay, it's the same with me. Shay was mentioning blue topaz is, looks teal. Like, that's my, I think, because that's December, right? I don't know. I feel like topaz is December. I can't I thought remember. topaz was November. I thought that was my birthstone. Oh, I was being it? really upset about it. Let me look. I mean, I'm really bad at knowing these things. Uh, Maybe I would be an amethyst, because, like, from what I see, it has, like, a really pretty purple color, and that's my yeah. favorite color. Yeah. So amethyst for me. Okay. Blue zircon is the most popular modern December birthstone. However, blue topaz and tanzanite are also modern options. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I forgot. I feel like we talked about this. I remember this camp in the Discord because we're talking about Alexandra, and apparently the birthstones shifted sometime because of jewelers and so on and stuff. I forget. Yeah. Dude, uh, Shay, our birthdays are so close. I'm December 15th. We're just, we're real close. Two days away from being birthday twins. Um, so a uh, recap of the book. What this one would be a little easier to do because it happened linearly. Um, <laughs> unlike the first one, so let's see what happens. We pick up, um, we're in Castrima with Essen, and basically, Castrima is this town of origins and. Essen has her doubts. She doesn't think it's going to happen, but uh, Yika, the chief, is like, no, I'm going to make it happen. Um, and while they're basically fumbling through stuff, because Alabaster has shown up, and Alabaster's like, you can control the obelisks, and here's some spinels, and you have to figure it out, and I can't do a Raji anymore, because every time I do it, I turn to stone, and the stone eater eats a part of me. Um, <laughs> so you have to learn this without me being able to show you anything. And Essen's getting very frustrated with that, and then... While that's going on, uh, her daughter Nassen is living with Jija um, in a very tense living situation because Jija had beat her brother to death for being an origin, and he realizes that she's an origin too. And so she spends a lot of her time like managing his like fear and anger about her um, until he takes her to this. I forget what they're called. Mm -hmm. Calm called. It's 
I remember it was New Moon. I think it was like founding New Moon, New Moon, something like that. Something with the moon, where there's allegedly this group of guardians who are like taking origins and like somehow not making them origins is what they're telling people. Um, but they get there and no one's really stopped being an origin. They just kind of are like hanging out with these guardians. Um, and we learn a lot more about the guardians. So Shafa's there. Shafa has been corrupted by whatever chip is in the back of his brain. He's had a little mind wipe. He does not remember really much of anything about his past um, at all. And so NASA meets him and like really connects with him and like sees him as like a second dad. And NASA realizes that there's like magic and stuff that she can manipulate, um, which isn't something a lot of origins can figure out. And basically, by messing around with that, she's been accidentally turning people to stone, sometimes purposely turning people to stone and like tapping into the obelisks. And she doesn't really live with her dad as much. Like there's like a big push and pull with her dad. Like her dad wants her to live with him, but also fears her and like wants her to stop being an origin, which isn't going to happen. And so she's spending more time with Jija and basically she decides at the end of the book that she is going to help align the obelisks, which is what Alabaster is trying to do. Alabaster's goal is to align the obelisks and capture the moon, which has been flown out of orbit. And by bringing the moon back, there shouldn't be any more food seasons. The earth or the plant should go back to life as normal. And Nassim is going to grab the moon. But we don't really know what for yet. Um, she's like allied with this like sinister stone eater who's also been like showing up and antagonizing Castrima. So they don't really know. We don't really know at this point what he wants or what his goal is. Um, in terms of what's going on in Castrima, they had their little meat, little meat shortage. They had a meat shortage there in crisis. And then these other nearby comms are like antagonizing them and like attacking them. And they, Basically, they couldn't really fight them off. So they kind of, Essen like grabbed a obelisk and kind of like trashed the calm by accident, like trapping the stone eaters in the all the crystals that are in Castrima. And so I think they're probably like packing up to leave, as this book concludes. Um, we also learn. Well, I'll leave that later if we want to talk about it. But I think those are like the main plot points that happened. Um, yeah. Is there anything? major that I should discuss? No, I mean, I think that's good. I think it'll come up as we talk if we, yeah. if it's important. Yeah. So there's a lot that we learn in this book. We always gonna, gonna learn a lot about a world in a Jemison book. There's always going to be a big reveal. I was wondering like, what were the wildest reveals for you? Either the first time you read this or maybe mm -hmm. even like on a second read. I mean, I think this book on the first read, the idea of this magic and like how it's called magic and like that, like learning more about orogeny and how there's like that thermodynamic side, but also this more just like particle magic side. And like, I don't know, the reveal of that was really cool for me. I don't know if that was like, it wasn't like a big shocking twist, but like that was a moment where I was like, ooh, I'm very interested in this. I think, for me, I think Alabaster turned into a stone eater. Cause like, if I'm reading it right, I was just like, wait, yeah. wait a minute. Cause like, I thought he was just gonna die and she was just gonna yeah. eat the rest of them. But like, there's a scene where like, um, two stone eaters are standing in front of her and she's just like, this one is Alabaster and describing, I was just like, wait, wait a minute. What? <laughs> what? Cause like the first time I read it, I thought he was dead. <laughs> But like this time, I'm just like, oh my gosh. I remember noticing that my first read too. And I remember on my first read being like, is he a stone eater? And like, that was my impression. And I was yeah. talking to other friends when they were reading it the first time. And I was like, yeah. And what did you think of that? Like stone eater that likes called Alabaster at the end. And they like missed it. Cause I think it happens like it's so really quick. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I don't think anyone really like identifies like, oh, that's Alabaster. Like, oh, there's an Alabaster stone eater wandering around. Hmm, that's funny. And then it's just like, yeah. yeah, like it's very yeah. like the end of that section before she like passes out or something like yeah. that. Yeah, no, that's oh. all one. I wonder, like, do they keep their memories? I think a lot of the. Oh yeah, I don't know much I about Stone Eaters right now. 
I remember they mentioned, because I thought, was it, I know they forget a lot of things, but I couldn't remember if that's just because they were like really old. Yeah. Or, so far we or, know that they don't remember a lot because of their immortality. Yeah, I remember we mentioned that. That's what has been told up to this point in the series. Okay. Yeah, because I just reread this like four days ago. <laughs> just like binged it out. Um, another scene that I really, I thought was striking was the whole like when Kastrim is like trying to figure out if they're gonna kick out all of the, the Rogas or whatever. And like when, um, is it Ika, Ika or Yika? I can't ever, I think it's Yika. Yika. Like when she actually like, made the one stone eater dot not stone eater the one oh, she cutter, cutter or something like cutter, when yeah. she actually yeah. like killed him like just that whole like tension and how things did resolve and then like when um as soon just like took control and was like no we're just not like <laughs> we're just not killing any more kids and it's not happening and i was like yes i, I love the way as soon took control of that because like if it was up to yika i feel like all of the origins would have been dead because like the mob was just so deadly and then Esun was just like no this is a season if you <laughs> don't want to die like you need us and we need to work together period I was just like wow yes take control <laughs> well and it was also such a scam right it's like no one yeah. was going to live so you're just yeah. going to like exactly. become inhuman and kill people for just living to not even live like it's just yeah. like yeah I don't I don't remember what the wildest reveal for me was this time around. I know, I know, I was annoyed by the magic thing because I remember um, who was it? I think it was Essen was asking about it. She's like, "Oh, what's this like other component of Orogeny you keep talking about? Um, and what does it have to do with me?" And Alabas was like, "What they used to call it? Like, I need this word for it so I can explain it." And Alabas was like, "They called it," and I'm like, <laughs> "Magic," and I was like. <sighs> <laughs> but what's interesting yeah, is that in this things. world they don't know what magic means like they don't have a yeah. definition of magic yeah i guess that is interesting so like in our world magic means fantasy but to our knowledge where they are they might have had fantasy books like thousands of years ago but right now they just have lore stone lore and whatever yeah, and they're they not all like pop lores. yeah so i i mean it's definitely cute like it's it's a cute little thing jemison did there kind of meta but i liked it <laughs> I was just I, frustrated. I wanted to learn more. Honestly, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I didn't guess I was this. Like, magic. <laughs> well, what's in a name, right? Like, just even knowing the name, like, it's still like, I mean, I guess the closest thing it is is like really intense particle physics if you wanted to like compare it to stuff. But we're also on a different planet, potentially a different like universe. So maybe it has different laws of physics. So, like, you know. I, I find like the way this world like the world building is so interesting because i feel like it takes place like so far ahead into the future but, like everything's been so completely destroyed that it's kind of regressed and like i like the way she does that aspect of the world building hmm. yeah. yeah no it's that's so cool because i think sometimes i mean this is kind of sci fantasy but like when i'm reading a fantasy book that's always like medieval or something i'm like yeah. why are we doing this why can't magic be in the future why can't and here it is but it gets to hold on to those like older technologies because of the apocalyptic cycle and i'm like i like yeah. i like this yeah i remember for me that was a wild reveal in the first book when they're like cause i was cuz no one everyone's like the dead civs are useless there's no point in talking about them they're just kind of like around it's just like scene dressing so i was like not expecting them to matter at all so when it was like the obelisks are actually super duper important and those dead sims are actually going to be a big plot point moving forward i was like wait what <laughs> i should have been paying attention to those things all the time mm -hmm. i so feel like there are certain things you get on on reread yeah this sounds like uh oh, yeah pay no attention to this guy uh-huh uh-huh <laughs> I definitely focus on the stone eaters a lot more this time around, like not because of what's going to happen in stone sky. Cause you know, like the first time around, I'm not like, they're kind of like weird elves and I don't know how to pay attention to them. <laughs> they're like, they're like worse elves. Cause like, you're not marrying a stone eater. Like no one's going to live with the stone eaters. <laughs> yeah. How they move is always so creepy. Like they're, they're like, have, do you guys watch Doctor Who or know what the Weeping Angels are? In no. Doctor Who? Okay, well, they're just statues that can only move if you don't look at them. And, like, 
It's like red light, green light, but scary. Yeah, and they like they will destroy you. They're monsters. But like here, that's how I imagine because whenever they move, come into a room, they like hold a pose and then they move in that pose, and it's like really. I think she does a good job describing how inhuman their movements are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I think what was the big reveal in this book this time around? I mean, I don't know if there was one for me on reread. Well, yeah, and I think that's why, like. I know some people don't like the Obelisk Gate as much as this, the fifth season because the fifth season has that huge um, reveal with Asun <laughs> and everyone being the yeah. same person. Yeah. But like, I was spoiled for that my first time reading the fifth season by someone's like Goodreads review. Someone's like, I loved how blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so like, that was like the first line of their Goodreads review. And I'm like, oh, oh thanks. No. So I didn't have a reveal in the first book, but I still loved it. And so mm. I wasn't expecting a reveal in the Obelisk Gate because I didn't, have that experience in the first one yeah. so Makes but sense. i i do think obelisk gates my my least favorite as far as any book could be because i don't know i think nasoon's point of view is always throw me i'm just like where why am i here i'm so confused oh the daughter <laughs> mm -hmm. i mean okay. i like her more this time because i have context but like my first read i was just like is you it didn't in her? person i don't dislike her but she's she, it's i always get thrown when i'm reminded she's a 10 year old because mm. her internal thoughts are not necessarily too old for her per se, but I'm just, I'm always thrown every time I remember, oh, she's only 10. Mm. Like, she was smarter. She was smarter than me at 10. I'm just saying. Well, and she's also like in a world where like maturity accelerates. Like, I'm not saying she wasn't like necessarily written correctly, but like, I just, yeah. I get really thrown by her predicament. Mm. And like, it's also really hard. Like if I, I could get really close to Nasoon if I wanted to, but like with my own like daddy issues, but I don't want to, like, I just don't want to <laughs> engage. <laughs> Cause like that whole thing is rough. Cause Jija's the worst. <laughs> I hate Jija so much. Yeah, I, I feel like you say this at least once, uh, once alive, Jija comes up and then it's just like, I can't stand Jija. I hate him so much. And like, cause there's like even a moment in the book, I think it was like where Nasun, she iced the house because her dad was about to like, her dad slapped her off the chair. Yeah. And then so like she iced the house as a warning and she was just like, oh, this is what, um, I forgot. My little brother must've felt, I forgot his name. Oh, uh, Uche. Uche, this is how Uche must've felt. And then she's like, oh, there's nothing that Uche could have done that would have warranted that reaction because like, even if he was an orogene, like, cause like the mom was always sessing and making sure like that they were safe, even from a distance. And it's because this baby knew he had a rock in his pocket. That's why he yeah. murdered his son for, uh. But that then, was a big moment too. Like remembering the, like the trigger of that death. Like, yeah. Like how it was yeah. just a kid noticing a rock. Like, he is complete garbage. And then, and then, like in the obelisk gate, like in later chapters, like they go through Jesus' trauma because I guess he had a run in with the origin, yeah. but like he couldn't control his power, so he was icing this guy. And I'm just like, okay, but like, I, feel, I'm like, I understand your trauma, sir, but it's not an excuse, like. And I think that's the point, right? Like Jemison's trying yeah. to be like, yeah, you might have like understandable reasons for your prejudice and hatred, but like that isn't like actually a valid excuse for killing humans that you love. Like that's yeah. without prompting. Like it's like you were saying, like Uche never threatened the life of his father. He just existed. Yeah. I hate him so much. And like, I think that was one of the reasons why I was so frustrated because I'm not going to lie. Nasun isn't my character, my favorite character to follow. So, and like the fact that we get a lot of Jija from her perspective, I understand why we needed it. And a lot of um, that what, Shafa, like the two worst guys, in my opinion, in the book. And I'm just like, oh, I know why we need them still. But Shafa's not, okay. So this is why I got confused when we were talking about Shafa for fifth season. Because to me, Shafa's a very different character the rest of the book. Because he's not Shafa anymore. He's different. Like, True. he has none of his memories anymore. If you don't have your memories, are you yourself? He had, I still don't like him. 
I thought he was like a pretty okay stand-in father figure. Like he's still like not an amazing yeah. person, but like he also has like Father Earth or whatever is doing stuff to him. Yeah. Oh right, that was something important that I missed from the recap. Um, while in Castream and it's still functioning, Tonky goes into the control room and is fiddling oh, around with stuff, yeah. and she finds some iron shards that say "Don't touch." And Yik is like, I'm going to kick you out because you've been skipping duties and this is unacceptable and you're going to endanger the calm. And Taki's like, yeah. <laughs> snags the shards and the shards go into her arm and start tunneling up to the sesapine in the back of her brain. And Essen has to cut off her arm before the shards puncture her brain. And the shards are like whispering the whole time. And they said they were like, had like these magic feelers to like, Dragon Don't they say like "Hello, quality? little one" or something crazy? And crazy? Yeah. yeah, that scene's so intense. That scene is an unputdownable scene. Like, That's that might have been the wildest there. reveal for me the first time around in this book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that and I wasn't expecting you to kill Cutter, but we can talk about that later. You you weren't expecting her to kill Cutter. I wasn't. Because he was in the council, right? I thought he was like kind of a close yeah. friend of his. So I was like, yeah. I didn't think she would do it. But. This was the first time we saw Yika really having to do what needed to be done. So I guess up to that point, we'd never seen her do that. It was a lot of talk, and she didn't need yeah. to do a thing. Like, well, from our perspective, I'm sure before we meet her, she had to. Yeah. I mean, I thought she uh, said that guy who got the boil bugs had to die. Yeah. Yeah. She, like, I wasn't like. So I guess that one didn't that feel she, the same. Like, kill someone. It was like I didn't think it would be Cutter. Um, I didn't think that she would be like so committed to the like, illusion of democracy at that point that she would like kill someone who it sounded like had probable reason to uh, react. Mm -hmm. um, what did what did Cutter do again? He did he ice someone? It was confusing, and also like I think I remember before that scene, Asun was like feel getting bad vibes from Cutter, so it might have yeah. been that he might have. I don't think he instigated, oh. but he might not have purposely not instigated, which doesn't make it right that someone did something. But you know, like when you're maneuvering tense situations, I think he didn't make the right judgment call to like keep things calm and like purposely like sat near someone in the washing room and didn't move. And then that person attacked him and then he iced them. And I think yeah. that was the order of events. Yeah, I think it was an attack. I think it was non, it wasn't super. It was like a like micro off on it, Yeah, it was basically like a micro thing. It was going to kill yeah. him, basically. Yeah. Um, and because like, and he then was he like, was, he, moved, he moved away from me and people were like, he was getting soap. And then. Yeah, <laughs> that's no, I, yeah, it was, it was interesting. Yeah. So we don't but, really know how that. Who, but like also, I feel like. like that might be an unreliable narration type situation because the people mm -hmm. that were like accusing Cutter, they yeah. are, they have prejudices against. Yeah, because I remember when I read that the first time around, I was like, I don't know if I trust them. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. just getting so. <laughs> yeah, but in, so like that's just the definition of like such a tough call, right? Because like yeah. probably in a perfect world, Cutter probably was maybe justified. But also, if most people believed he wasn't, and you're trying to keep everyone yeah. together, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if I would have made the same call, but it, it was definitely stunning to me that the call was made. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I didn't have this plan, but now that we're here, how do you think, what do you think about how Yika was running Castrima? Um, like, do you think... Like, it seemed like she was good at doing stuff in peacetime, but do you think that, like, she could have kept things together when things went bad? I don't think she, because like once people have their prejudices, it's hard to reason with them. So honestly, I think she did the best with what she had. I don't think it would have mattered if she was like an even better leader or like the best leader there was. Mm -hmm. I feel like because she's an origin, like mm -hmm. she would have still faced the same struggle struggles regardless. Yeah, I mean, like even ignoring that the whole like trying to have this mini utopia of a calm like they were running out of meat and they didn't really have a plan from what i could tell like True. they were going to rely on cannibalism for a while you know and stuff but as people do in a season <laughs> but like that can't i mean since especially as an origin they know this is going to last for millennia at this point like there was no long-term plan it was very much what's this generation going to do to make it Salter said, yeah. she was a solid leader for sure. 
times and situations change, but she did her thing. Yeah. Um, so I was, cause I don't, I don't know. Cause I don't know. I don't know what I thought about her as a leader when like this time around, like when Essen had to step in and be like, we're not, we're not doing this. Cause to me, it seemed like Yika was so like focused on like ideals that like, sometimes it seemed like she couldn't really handle like what was like, mm -hmm. Stone Eater comes up and says, get rid of all your origins and we'll let you live. And so obviously there's going to be like infighting and like, yeah, cause like, let's do a vote. And I was like, let's do a vote. Yeah. <laughs> let's handle this with a vote. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if there's really, I I could have come up with a better solution for you, but I was just like, like, I don't know, if I was like an origin and I'm doing the math here, I would, like, she wasn't worried that some of the origins might like panic and like do something bad. Like if I was an origin doing the math, I'd be like, I'm getting voted out. Like how many of us are in this com? Like more than usual, but I don't think they were a majority. Um, yeah. I don't know. It just seemed like. I don't know if she planned for like what would really happen like when people get panicky. Um, mm -hmm. I don't like I don't know if I don't know her friend who's who is it Hiarka who's a leader. If Hiarka would have had some suggestions that would have helped her out if Essen wasn't there, but I felt like Essen really needs to be there to be like no like <laughs> executive decision yeah. time. Like this is what we're doing, and you're either gonna do it or you're gonna leave. Um, which I was kind of surprised that Yika didn't do because it seemed like she was very comfortable. Like with Essen being like, I'm in charge and you're going to do, you know, follow my vision for the comm. So I was kind of surprised that it was like, she didn't do something more decisive, I guess, until Essen stepped in. Well, I think, I think Ika was really trying to hold on to the naive idea that people would support each other. And I think that was a flaw, like you're bringing up. And then I don't think though Essen would be like, a good replacement leader. Like there's nothing that we've learned about her in the past two books that I'm like, I want you to be in charge. Like, absolutely yeah. not. <laughs> but so like, it seemed like, and also everyone knows from all the other stuff how powerful as soon is. And I don't think Yika is a pretty okay, like self-taught origin, but like, I don't think she actually like has mm. the power to really threaten a whole group of people, mm. like individuals yeah. that come and attack her. But also that wouldn't be her instinct, right? Like we've seen Essun have to deal with people attacking her livelihood again and again, you know? So I think she's more, it's more her instinct to be aggressive and it's more Ika's to be like, we can talk about it. We will we'll be on the same page, but that wasn't realistic at the time. Especially, I think that part which, where you said um, Essun has had her livelihood threatened again and again. Cause like when we get a piece of Ika's backstory cause she got caught doing orogeny but like instead of the townsfolk trying to kill her they were just like they were trying to figure out how to train her so i feel like that perspective is like that piece of her character arc is what led her to make these naive decisions yeah mm -hmm. like and I, I don't blame her i mean i i wanted when i first read the obelisk gate when we first get there i'm like oh this is so cool i want this to work and, you know, we leave the book with it not in a good place. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Yuka is just an interesting character because she's such a mix of like, she just like, because she can do like the, I'm the leader, I make the decisions. She can do that stuff, but she also does try to get people on board. Um, she tries like, to delegate, yeah. She yeah, really like with the council and stuff where she's like, I want buy-in. So like, we're going to figure out where everyone's at. Um, yeah, it's interesting. She does seem to do better in peacetime than. Yeah. No, I mean, I do, I do like her. I, I like her styles of leadership. Like, I would like her to be a project leader of like a company I worked at. Like, I like it in principle. Yeah. <laughs> Walter says they change leadership like companies do when they're about to sell off. They get rid of the visionary family leader and get someone cutthroat, and there Hassan was the cutthroat. Hassan yeah, was. She went. Yeah. <laughs> We're not doing the vote. <laughs> Well, and this is like an interesting theme I've seen across many fantasy books because a lot of fantasy books love to look at like when things are at their toughest, right? Yeah. Like transitions. And it almost always goes the solution to keep things at peace or stable is to go dictator, like almost every time. Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting like that that's the, um, and I don't know if that's based off history or based off, you know, the fact that we really don't trust the human condition. 
like it feels realistic but like in so many fantasy books i read when people try to be democratic and try to trust the people but it's like an apocalyptic time it always reverts back to okay we just need to get things done so i'm the dictator now listen to me and <laughs> yeah that's interesting i haven't really thought about that I've, mm -hmm. I've been noticing it a lot this year while i've been reading yeah i mean now yeah. that you've said it <laughs> it's, i didn't notice until you said something and i'm just like wow I mean, it's not just like, well, at first I thought it was just one author because it was one author's works that I kept seeing this theme. Mm -hmm. But then like, I'm reading this book and it's like, this is a very different author. Like they write very different fantasy, so. Yeah. So we kind of touched on a little earlier how people feel about Nassen. Like in the previous book, we're mostly following Essen. We only know Essen's side of the story. So she's who our sympathies mostly lie with. And now we're introduced to Nassen. And we have to reconsider a lot of the things about the characters we were previously introduced to through Essen. Um, so what do you think of Nassen as like a narrator and a character and like the dimension that she brings to the, the story? I, I thought she was an incredibly complex character. Like one of the most complex characters I've read. And I also find it so interesting because she doesn't know that Shafa found her mother. And so, cause like Nasun has a lot of trauma from the abuse inflicted upon her by her mother. But like what she doesn't know was that Shafa was the one that inflicted that abuse. And then her mom continued the cycle. And now she's looking at, basically I could think of, now she's looking at the original abuser as like the father figure. And I thought like that dynamic was just so interesting to me. And I, and I think that's like one of the reasons why I hated Shafa. Cause I'm just like, Nasun, I want you to know what he did to your mother. Like you need to know, but yeah. Yeah, I thought like it, bouncing off of that, like when she ends up at the Antarctica fulcrum and like she gets that mental click of like, this is why my mother is the way she is and how she, mm -hmm. I thought she did a thing that was very relatable to me where how she now had this layer of empathy and understanding, but still not saying this condones what you did to me. Yeah. Like, I can get it. I can see why, but like, I still don't appreciate the abuse. Like yeah. she had a very nuanced self-awareness for a 10 year old. Yeah. But also at the same time had at that- the same time, that's hard. <laughs> no, I was gonna say like at other times though, like her needs were very simple and childlike. Like, I just want to be held and loved. Like, I just want to feel some stability mm -hmm. around me, which I do feel, I mean, I, I like to feel stability around me, but I do feel like as a 10 year old, when the, you're in an apocalypse, that's like, you want someone to be in your corner. But mm -hmm. I don't know. She's a hard character for me. Cause like, I, I don't find her realistic sometimes. I don't know. She's really interesting. Yeah. I remember the, I think Nassin brings something very important to the story, obviously. Um, and the dynamics between her and Essen are like what make this my like one of my favorites in the trilogy. Um, and like one of my favorite books. But um Yeah. I don't I remember the first time around, I really didn't like her as a character. Um <laughs> I don't know how I feel about her now. Um but yeah, I didn't like her as a character. Um, I didn't like that she liked Shafa. Um, <laughs> I didn't like what she did at the Antarctic Fulcrum. Um, and I think it's interesting. I don't know if she had known about Shafa, if that would have changed things. Cause I, I remember there's a line where she, where Shafa said there are things I did in my past basically that like were very bad. I'm not, I don't like them. I'm not proud of them. And she's like well and in her head she's like well i like shafa now so like those things don't matter like he didn't mean those things that he did yeah, um, he straight up said he used to like abuse kids like how she was abused like i think he i think one of the reasons why i like this shafa more than past shafa is like he is very self-aware that he was a bad person and isn't he's very honest with this 10 year old like this 10 year old gets a lot of like respect from shafa in terms of knowledge exchange i guess at least mm -hmm. Like he's he's very upfront with what he knows at least, which he doesn't know everything right now because he's all like his brains in pieces. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't 
love him, but like I definitely don't hate him as much as you guys do. But I think that's because I don't. He's not the person that made the decisions in the first book. Like he's to me, he's just not that person. He can't be, <laughs> and he's actively choosing to make different decisions based off what he knows. <laughs> you have a more nuanced take than I do. <laughs> I'm just uh, like selfish. I hate this no matter what. <laughs> I'm like that's cool. That's cool. That's cute. But like, um, uh, <laughs> well, she's still super young. Like Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna read Salter's comment real quick. She's still that's super good. young and making a choice as she needs to. It's wild to see her trying to make do. Yeah, it is really mm -hmm. wild watching her scramble for to like process all this stuff. And I think that's partially why I didn't like her and like the Antarctic Fulcrum stuff. So it's like. Wow, like all these people died for really no reason. Like <laughs> you learned something that made you uncomfortable and now a whole town of people who are kind of like you in some ways who could have maybe, cause I, I, we could talk about the Antarctic Fulcrum more cause I'm not sure I completely understand what's going on there. But like, to me, I was like, they could have had better lives. Like <laughs> there were things didn't have to end this way and they did because you were uncomfortable and you're very powerful and so things things got wild my thing about the um the antarctic fulcrum is that i feel like she has a level of attachment it's because she has a level of attachment to shafa that she doesn't have so like for her it's just like these people are nothing to me and these people are the reason why my mother is the way that she is but like you know when you get to know somebody and you care for them and then you find out something about their past and you're just like, no, not, not, not you. Like, I, like, I can't imagine you doing that. And I feel like she has like these rose tinted glasses when it comes to Shafa. Cause like, even though he's telling her, Hey, I was a horrible person. Hey, I did this, this and that. She's just like, no, not my Shafa. Like my Shafa would never have done that to me. Cause at one point she says that she was just like, she asked him like if you had met me then would you have done the same thing and he was like yes and that's when it's just like no <laughs> i don't think you mean it she's desperately trying to cling to any adult that will care for her unconditionally like she's yeah. just desperately trying to find that and it, i think that comes across super strong like she's so complicated like i don't know how many rereads i'll have to do to understand her like she's just like so much because also like how she learns is so childlike, but like the definition of how play leads to learning, like we always forget that if you just let a human creature just explore, they'll learn more than just if you force them down like a rigid path. Because look how much she learned versus her mom, like by just True. existing and like having goals. And like, you know, she had a goal. I want to heal Shafa. And then look what she learned. <laughs> it's just mm. insane. Can we talk about the Arctic Fulcrum really quick? So, cause I'm just trying to remember what actually was going on there. So they were origins from the fulcrum, um, but it happened. They killed off their guardians, which for some reason Shafa didn't like. Um, and then were they enslaving people? Cause I thought they said they had people that there were, there were people who were forced to be there or no, is that somewhere else? Am I thinking of the place threatening Castrima? I think you're thinking of the place for threatening cast stream. I, what I remember was that I think the, and I could be wrong, but I thought the Antarctic fulcrum was just like, they got rid of their guardians and they were supposed to kill themselves, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. And I don't really remember as of right now why that bothered Shafa, but. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Cause I, I also don't know if we know at this point because we know that the earth, ang earth is angry. Father earth is controlling Shafa to some extent now, but we don't really know what he wants or like where he lines up in terms of like what's happening with like capturing the moon and all that. So maybe it just won't make sense until the third book, but I was kind of confused why he cared. Cause he's not with the fulcrum anymore. Like why father earth would care that the or Oh wait, father earth just hates origin. So maybe that's why he was angry. I think wasn't was. it said that like origins were the reason why father yeah. earth lost his son. So I think Father Earth was probably whispering in his mind, like, kill him, kill them all, you know? Probably. Yeah, it might've been like that. Like, I, th I think at the time when I was reading it, I thought of it as they wanted the resources that was there. 
like you know mm. but i i don't know i don't think that was explicitly said but i think that's what my brain filled in as my answer <laughs> for no. the question but no i mean now that you bring it up i don't have strong answers i don't okay. remember it didn't stick out that explains why he's like he's also in pain because he won't kill Nasum. And so like there was like a one, one at one point that the other two origins, like they were completely taken over by Father Earth and they immediately tried to kill Nasum. Yeah. So I think that's just the reason why. Okay. Yeah, like it's like in this book we learn that there's this bigger war. We learn about Father Earth being like kind of a thinking entity and like You've got stone eaters that are on different sides and you have like the guardians where we don't know where they come from. And we've got orogenies and like, you know, trying to figure all that out. It's a mess. I think it becomes clearer in the next book, but in this book, it's all just like, what is happening? Okay, and the I'm moon? Not alone in that. okay. <laughs> I was just wondering if someone understood it any better than I did. Um, Alter says, that was a curious showdown to me. I was wondering if he didn't think they'd figure it um, safe to not fight him, so they just got to it. All right, so they did. Who started the conflict? I forget who. Because I thought someone made a move for Shafa, and then Shafa killed them all. Um, all the the heads of the Antarctic. I don't remember. I remember being very, very reactionary, so I, yeah. I thought Nasun noticed something and then reacted with her obelisk, but I'm not positive. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, maybe it was for Shafa, like, oh no, these this fulcrum might find our fulcrum that's a fake fulcrum that's like not supposed to exist, like the new moon thing. And I don't know, maybe wanted to get ahead of that. It didn't really make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. It did. Because, like, why doesn't he kill his own origins if it's a season? Because he, yeah. he was, you know? Yeah, because it didn't seem like, from what I remember, the Antarctic fulcrum, how did they run into them again? I don't. I didn't think they were aggressive. I didn't think they were, like, issuing declarations or anything. No, no, they found out about it because Nasuna oh, right. notices it. She right? says them, right, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's not, and, like, the book's all, like, and it's not Kestrima, it's something else. Oh, right. And so they went to investigate it. And then that's how everything went. Oh, so if they just went to investigate it, so then they maybe didn't remember it was the Antarctic fulcrum. And then once they're there, they are going to kill these people that they think are guardians. And even, oh, they re they realized that these guardians were broken. That's what happened. Like they were on eggshells because they're like, oh, if these are real guardians, they're going to kill us because we shouldn't be alive. And then they realized, oh, these are the guardians that have like the messed up stuff. We're supposed to kill them. So that's what started it. Okay. So it was just investigation led to conflict, but there was no like, we need to get rid of the Antarctic fulcrum as like the start. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes a little more sense to me. Um, yeah. So another character, you know, there's the Sony who's talking to Nassen, who I think they call it a steel or gray man, depending on who's talking. And then Ho is still back at Kostrima, and he's killed a lot of the Stone Eaters there, from what I remember. Um, he's also changed a lot since the first book. What did you think of Hoa and how his character changed? Like, do you like or trust this new Hoa? Do you miss the old Hoa? I never trusted Hoa. I remember when when I first when I first read this book, I was like, mm, I don't trust this Hoa. And now he's gonna be eating my baby Esun's arm. Like, I don't. Wait, is that a spoiler? <laughs> Is that I don't think so. I think we discussed that. I think we established that in this book. Okay. That, like, the stone eaters follow people around, and as they turn a stone from the Raj and that Essen is now learning, they they chomp. Yeah. But yeah, I I don't know. I I can't trust his intentions. I haven't read the third book yet, so like maybe that will completely change my mind. But as of right now, I'm just like I don't trust you. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean. I think first read, I'm trying to remember first read thoughts. I think I didn't necessarily distrust him because actions up to this point have always been protective. But I also mm -hmm. like, I, I definitely knew that I don't know his agenda and I didn't know what the agenda was. And the book itself seems to be saying like, there are agendas we don't know about that are trying to use soon. 
So like, yeah. I think I was kind of just like apprehensive, like cautious sort of thing. Yeah. I remember I figured out that he was a stone eater pretty early on in the first book, just because of the little epilogues or whatever you call them, the little notes at the end of the chapters. Um, but I wasn't really sure like what that meant. Like I wasn't sure if he was like a separate type of stone eater because he seemed, I thought he was fleshy when they met him. Like he wasn't doing regular stone eater stuff. Um, I don't know if we really still know how he was able to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, it seemed like he purposefully like had a more human version of himself, but even yeah, then like he, he was as heavy as stone. Like he wasn't completely like a human and stuff like that and would have been cold to the touch even in his boy form. I think one of the things that put me in the maybe you're not nefarious category, but maybe I still don't trust you was the whole like when she realizes, oh, you were the stone eater in that first obelisk that I took up from the ground. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know, it's because you asked how I was doing. Like, it felt like that that started on like a kind of pure footing at least. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, just saying hi to Adrian. Yeah. Um, I can just I can just say because there's a little in the conversation. Hi, Adrian. <laughs> um, we're like 45 minutes in, but like we're gonna be going for a little bit, so you haven't missed the entire thing. Um, like I I yeah, basically all we know so far is that he's gonna help Essen. But he also says he feels guilty about what's gonna happen whenever she achieves her goal. Yeah. So Yeah, there's definitely unknown things. Like there's a betrayal coming, it seems. <laughs> um so that's not looking great for Hoa, but <laughs> for now he's behaving, I guess. My um, thing is like there's a there's a passage from Hoa's perspective where he's like you are all chess pieces in like this grander game and even you my poor Essun. so i'm just like huh i can't trust him yeah especially since like the game pieces are like so varied like mm -hmm. like from the perspective of this book father earth seems very angry and very irrational like if he wants his moon back, why does he want to kill all the origins, which are the only way to get the moon back? That seems like an overreaction if I'm giving Father Earth sentience, but he seems like he's just really angry based off what all the stone eaters are saying. And I don't really know what these immortal stone eaters want because they're immortal and immortality can just make you have really odd goals in life. Like, so I don't even know, like, it's not even like two-sided chess, it's like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, did anyone miss the old Hoa? I know some people were like really like that dynamic where like Essen basically has another child to care for. Um, um I like the info dumps, so no, I just liked learning <laughs> things. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't miss the old Hoa because, like, as soon as we were introduced to this child, I was like, I don't know, I don't trust. This child, I'm sorry. I feel like suspicion's confirmed. <laughs> We're getting somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and he's also the narrator. It's revealed that he was narrating the first book and he's still narrating. I th is he narrating Nassen's point? No, I think he is narrating the whole thing of this one too, right? Yeah, like he'll have before Shafa and Nassen chapters and now we have to get back over here because it's also yeah. a part of you and then it goes you know, yeah. into it. I thought that reveal in the, the the first book, I thought it was amazing because I I I think this is only the second book I've read in second person. And and then like I was just like, why why is this one particular perspective in second person? It's throwing mm -hmm. me off. And then I got to the end and I was like, okay, okay, she's a genius. And Kate Jemison is a genius. It's it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if we still figure it out yet, though, why why him, you know? No, that's um, not revealed yet. So I guess we'll figure it out in the third book. More reveals to come? I'm not ready. <laughs> I was about to say, you got you got a lot of knowledge coming your way. <laughs> yeah. And he's doing the interludes, too, right? 
So I remember in other books, she'd have the interludes, but they were narrated by someone completely different. And in this case, I think they're still from Hoa's point of view. They felt like actually like his direct point of view at times. Cause like one of them was him crawling through and killing stone eaters, right? That was an interlude. Yeah, that was an interlude. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really said, bad at keeping track of those things. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't take good notes on that part. Salter so says, seems like he's still there in glimpses. My impression is that he came as his younger form for himself as much as her, a mutual calibration. Yeah, he did say that he missed the parts of that, I think. But I think we were, we find out why in the third book, if I remember correctly. Um, I remember the third book being a lot about Hoa um, or how the Stone Eaters came to be and like the origins of this big feud that we just kind of step in the middle of. We definitely understand the war better-ish. I don't remember it right now, but I remember I be having more understanding. <laughs> um, so another question I had was, oh, wait, are you two theme readers or are you more like character readers? So I might skip I'm the question of your character readers. Character for me. It depends. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. themes. The most I think with Jemison it can be both. It depends yeah. on the author. Okay, I'll throw the question out and we'll see if you feel like talking about it. Something I was noticing a lot in this book on like reread especially was we're talking a lot about like education and how people learn things and like hierarchy and like how do we talk about things and like who does that like serve? Like whose like goals does that further? Um, I was wondering like what you thought about that. Cause I was realizing as I was going through like there's like so many different perspectives on like how people learn and then also like, I don't know, how people even just like react to being like, oh, how I learned was bad. So like, where do we go from here? Um, well, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, I really did like how Nessun was kind of an example of how rigid teaching isn't always the only way to show skill. Like you don't have to go through something like rigorous, like the fulcrum, which the fulcrum is a very rigorous, way to be trained that we saw in the first book. But Nessun is just as much of an expert, if not more, like she's probably what they say, a four or five ringer equivalence sort of. And mm. she's just completely self-taught. And we see that with um, Ika, who she has her own powers that she learned and like taught herself that like, so I think the bush that the book really shows that like, there's not a right way to learn. And that I don't, I mean, I definitely think the thermodynamic approach to orogeny is kind of shown to be the less nuanced form. Like it's not as exact and you can't do all the things. But I don't necessarily think it's like a bad way because it does allow people with not as much skill to like not freeze people randomly. Like it gives mm -hmm. them control. But I think mm -hmm. it just shows that things can be different, which I like. He even says in the book that Alabaster after a certain level that he couldn't even be taught from the fulcrum. Like he, everything he knows is self-taught. Even though he did use the principles of the fulcrum, he is still self-taught and that's how he became a 10 ringer. And it also mentions how Nasun plateaued. Like after, I think it was her fourth ring that she just plateaued and she didn't really learn much until she met Alabaster. And then, like, she got even more skilled when she was just being a mother trying to protect her kids. True. Like, that was just, like, existing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also Tonki, she learned, not Tonki, um, Ika, because when they had to make the tunnels, Ika had to teach her how, and, like, that's how she was able to learn how to open the obelisk gate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and I mean, I think it's also interesting because, like, this magic system is, like, very analytical in many ways. And like people always think when you're learning something analytical like STEM or math or whatever, like there is a path, there is a textbook, you go in like chronological order and you need to know these foundations to get to this step and do that. Like it's very foundationally taught, but like the book itself is like, but it doesn't have to be that way. And that's also true in mathematics and science. Like if mm -hmm. you don't think in the way that algebra is taught, that's not cause you're wrong. It's because we literally only know how to teach it one way cause we're ridiculous at least I'm talking in the United States, like other countries yeah. like Japan and China do have different ways to teach algebra and like, yeah. 
So I think it's a fun comparison for me with that because I have a lot of STEM education opinions mm. about how mm -hmm. we do things. Mainly mm -hmm. because I think the book kind of shows like not everyone learns the same way and that's okay. <laughs> like, mm. Yeah, I think I was, um, I guess for me why I posed the question was because, you know, we do see people who like exist outside the system, like the, the fulcrum like even understands and like how to talk about them. Like they were like, like she had been to Castrima and Alabaster was like, everyone here is just a rock pusher. Like they'll be lucky if they can even push rocks. And it's like, well, how do you compare these abilities, right? Cause like maybe Yika can't push a rock but Yika has been like attracting people and she can like ward people away and she can do things that are very yeah. precise that kind of like you can't really even categorize in terms of how like the fulcrum has been doing the rings and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I thought it was interesting how, like, that's still, like, the benchmark, in a way, for, like, Alabaster and, and Essen, um, the rings. I think it was also, I was interested in how they're talking about how, like, the way that the Fulcrum taught them was, like, actually, like, bad if you try to, like, learn anything outside of that. Like, trying to think that way to teach other kids was, like, making Essen regress when she's trying to learn with Alabaster. Um and like how that was kind of like an agenda in some way, like Albas was like, I want to talk about like the sky and like the obelisks and like figure out how to set the origins free and how to like restructure the world. And like the Fulcrums are not interested in any of that. So like they don't teach them how to do any of that. They don't have the language to like even talk or like ask about stuff like that. Um, and how like even they set up like the system where it's supposed to be like advancing and stuff, they don't really want people to advance. like. <laughs> They're like, how many like 10 ringers you see around? Not many, because they're all like, a lot of them are at the nodes. Um, yeah. They're just like disappeared. Um, no, and I really, I really liked that whole thing where like, as soon as having to deal with the idea that the definition of the equivalence of intelligence, right? Skill and orogeny that she's been taught is not the right way to measure that yeah. skill. And I think that's a thing we still do all the time with, like I said, measuring intelligence or someone's aptitude in a thing. Like one exam is not the right way to test everyone, their aptitude in understanding a thing. And I like that she had to be forced to deal with that with um, Yika and stuff like that. I thought yeah. that was awesome. Um, also Inan, cause like Inan was able to like control like the sea yeah. and the water. Yeah. And, and she and Alabaster couldn't do that. Yeah. Mm. And like, we have these two characters who kind of do have like this superiority complex, but don't know these other things. Cause they, like, I think there was a scene with Alabaster and S in this book where she's like, they're just, you're wasting your time. They're just rock pushers. He's like, Inan was a rock pusher and he just yeah. like shut up and. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was really struck by that because like this Alabaster, he probably like knows the most and is like the most like advanced. Like, like I think Nassin's getting there about if she's quite there yet. And like Alabaster, it seems like still has this like fulcrum superiority complex in terms of like what he thinks other origins can do. Like, I don't know. For me, I kind of question like what, I don't know. We kind of talked about this last time around where I was like, oh, is Alabaster revolutionary or not? Um, how does he think about revolution versus like um, Essen? And I had kind of thought of him as revolutionary before. And now that we're like, we're revisiting some things, I'm kind of like questioning I don't know. I don't think he could pull off a revolution by himself. Um, I think he would need, <laughs> I think he'd need like someone <laughs> who understands the people a lot better to like direct him in terms of like what he's doing. I think that's what it comes down to. Um, like it seems like he's really good at thinking and questioning things, but it seems like in terms of like getting other people to think and question things and like doing that in like a, like a big way, not like, not just like what he can do, but like, everything else it seems like it's something he struggles with yeah and i also liked with alabaster how it pushes against the idea with education that if you know something you can automatically teach and disseminate that information that's an that's a assumption we have in education right and yeah. he is a horrendous teacher yes i'm like yes i like when's the last time you taught somebody <laughs> like, do you know how, how to do this? not since you <laughs> So I, I also like that part of him. But yeah, I don't, I think what also is interesting in this book, because we're two books in, and like, obviously we're trying, like things are, there's a war going on and things are trying to change the status quo, but we're also in an apocalypse. So the first priority is survival. 
Yeah. So like, how do you even get a group of people to revolt in yeah. this scenario we're even in? Yeah. Uh, Adrian, so I'm just catching up with the comments. Adrian says, I think this will be one of the first series I feel that I have to reread because there's so much information. The story to me is more intricate than others, so I will reread it. I think it's definitely worth yes. it. I think like from a craft perspective, you just realize things about like what N.K. Jemison has been like setting up this whole time. But also like, I feel like there's definitely stories and like connections that I didn't make until I was rereading it. Um, Shay with the Hoppy says, yay, STEM. <laughs> Adrian says, the fulcrum has their own agenda, so teaching them in their ways to control thing, Alabaster is free of that. Yeah. Um, Salter says, their, um, the origins are still defaulting to the value system they are brought up with, even from their subjugation. Yeah, yeah I thought that was so interesting because um, Alabaster, especially from the very first book, he's just like, F the system. We don't need this. Like, you know, we need to move past it. But then you see him in the second book calling people rock pushers. And it's like, sir, you're making judgments. You're ignorant judgments based on the system that trapped you in the first place. Yeah. That was well, and that's just like how like things can sink in, right? Like you could actually be morally against a thing, but still like accidentally believe the things that system like put into you. Like yeah. such a good example of unconscious bias. Yeah. Things. Uh, Shay says, Oh, I think this is about uh, Alabaster as a teacher. I like that take because mine was totally different. I thought the way he acted towards her was a way of teaching her. Like sometimes the lessons come out hard and harsh because the truth is that way. Sometimes I think hard lessons that shatter the way you've been taught your whole life will always come out hard and harsh because it's shaking your entire worldview. I think that makes sense for like the philosophical conversations. I think my example that I was thinking of specifically was more when he's trying to actually just get her to see the magic. And like they spent so many weeks trying to do that. And like it like was so difficult and caused so many fights. Like, I think the book condenses it down, but like the actual time period in which they were going through that was rough. So I think that's what I was thinking of. But I think you're right. Like he had to give her a lot of harsh truths that she wasn't always ready for, like the reveal of the other side of the world, um, that undead sieve. What were they called? I don't know. The place where all the stone eaters were. I don't know if it has a name. I thought, I thought the stone I don't remember what he called it or something, it. but like where Alabaster um, was taken after the island stuff last mm -hmm. book. Yeah. This is kind of a detour, but I'm curious. What are the other ways to teach that one? Like, could you, like, characterize how it's taught in the U.S. and then a few other ways that it's taught on the parts of the I, I can't do, like, the other countries, but, like, so what we've been t trying to change here in the U.S. is so a lot of stuff's taught in, like, a passive teaching model. And what passive is is you sit in a classroom and someone talks to you and you take notes and then you do homework, study, take an exam, right? It's kind of like that. Maybe if you're lucky, there'll be some group work or a discussion section. But there's active teaching that has been shown to be way better for all students, especially students from minority classes and things where instead of being lectured to for 50 minutes to an hour, it's more partial lecture, partial discussion at the same time you do small groups, like you're engaging with the material in real time with the professor. And it's it works better for more people because not everyone has good auditory processing, not everyone has the focus for that time. So it's more just like, not just doing everything the same way we've done it since 1910, because not everything we did in 1910 is like the, the, just the best. Because a lot of people, at least in college, I'm talking specifically college, there's actually way more active learning happening, I think, at high school levels now, because people actually get taught how to teach in high school. You don't have professors learn how to teach in college. They don't take teaching courses. They just yeah. are told to teach. <laughs> and like, I don't know, as all of us who make content, we know that talking to other people is a skill you practice. It's not like a thing, like you practice it either by doing a bunch of videos, like yeah. you don't have to actively do it, but like, it's not something you're naturally good at. Very yeah. few people sit in front of a camera or talk to other people about their thoughts and are like perfect at it. it and like, I don't know. So, I mean, we have known since the eighties that active learning techniques are better at getting more information to more brains, but it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of changing of materials and it means you don't just learn from a textbook. So then textbook companies don't like that. And it's just mm, oh, yeah. <laughs> textbook. Yeah. <laughs> Cute and that one. I was just cringing. So I was thinking back to my early uh, videos. And there were. <laughs> ones about how talking to a camera is a skill. 
Um, yeah, but I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, and teaching is also a skill, but like universities are like, well, we pay teachers to be researchers, not teachers. Yeah. It's a, it's a whole yeah. Mess. yeah, you could, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it's fun. it's a crazy thing. I mean, I want to become a teacher at a university. And so that's why I've been learning a lot about it. But yeah. yeah. I also just like as a physicist hate everyone who's like, I could never do physics. I'm not smart enough. It's like, no, that's not true. You inherently would know things. It's just that they force you to have to learn it with math. But like I could teach you how a circuit works without any math. Like I could I could teach you with a Christmas tree. Like, it's just people don't choose to do that. Like, we just don't make science accessible. And then we land in a pandemic where people don't trust vaccines. And <sighs> I feel some type of way. Not the real world connections. It's, it's so sad. OK, I feel like this is <laughs> off topic. But I feel like the whole, like, coronavirus vaccine situation, I feel like it's gotten worse because, like, it's it happened in a year and it's like, Technology has evolved. Did you expect it to take 40 years? I don't understand. I was expecting two or three, honestly. I had to talk to like my cousins who work in like pharma stuff and then walk me through. Not really what? walk me through it because I don't no, yeah. it wouldn't be I mean, anything if they did, yeah. but like explain like, oh, like there's a lot of paperwork stuff and like the paperwork got expedited, but like we had this kind of already started, so it wasn't like we're just going from scratch. So that's why yeah. I understand people wanting to get real information and understand what's happening. But there, that's not what's happening now, I think. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know, especially since like the mRNA vaccines have been like, they were funded during Obama's administration. We've been researching this type of vaccine for a very long time. It's just, this is the first time we're using it. Oh. Yeah. And it's also a technique we use a lot in the labs to do other things and it's, 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 it's very simple. It's honestly the simplest way you could do this. Like in terms of like people get nervous about putting things in their body. It's like, it's like three components. That's it. It's like super simple. Mm -hmm. but, I'm going to catch but, up some of the comments. Yeah. Um, I like that Essen dealt with the same issue of not understanding how to teach when she's trying to explain things to Yika, even though Essen was a little literal teacher in Tiramo. Yeah. Um, Sirius has a great bit of contrast and contradiction around people using protecting and fearing the power of the people in their lives. Um, it's bleeding into how the guardians and various forms of teachers are operating. I didn't, I forgot the guardians are kind of teachers too. Um, yeah, they're like mentor-ish in weird, weird, weird ways. Mm -hmm. She said, yeah, I've always hated that about professors. That was always such a, a sh shot in the dark. And if you're going to professor who like teaching or someone who just wanted to be in a lab. Well, it's also yeah. like you pay so much for college and you're like, wait, yeah. this person isn't like trained to do this skill yeah. that I'm paying them for. Kids are a lifesaver. Tutoring groups are a lifesaver. Yeah. yeah. Um, vaccine Honestly. hesitancy is a byproduct of a system being built on obedience and fear rather than informed consent and education. We're dealing with trying to force people to do what we want for expedience, even though we know why we're in this situation. Um, should I should say that. And yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's, there's a lot of things that are problems. There's a lot. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so I think that was kind of everything I wanted to say on that. Um, so I was just wondering in general, um, did you have a favorite like relationship or character or like magical element that was introduced in this book? Mm -hmm. Mm, Alabaster was my favorite in the first book. He was still my favorite in the second. I know I know a lot of people hate him, but I'm just like, he's a baby trying to live, trying to survive this abuse. Uh, okay, like, let him live his life in peace. And then the scene, sorry, I'm getting off topic, where he, he meets Essen for the first time, and he's like, I'll never forgive you for Karu. I was just like, but I understand why you did it. Ah! Their whole relationship is insane. And then like the reverse, like at the end where she takes out just the two rings he made for her and gets rid of the rest. I just, well, and just like every time Asun is introspective about their relationship and it's just like, I hate him and I love him and I miss him. Like the yeah. complexities of the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just realizing that now is that like, even though I think Inan was who like tied the triad together and who like 
Essen was like the most like involved with like sexually and like romantically like her and there's like an intimacy to her and Alabaster's relationship. Um, it's still like a very like deep relationship. There's a lot of layers to it. And there is something about it to me that feels, I don't know, maybe if I have a, <laughs> I don't think I will probably ever have a relationship that has tested as much as theirs. But like, to me, there's something about it that's so, it seems like more than a friendship in some ways or like more than like a message. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, to explain. but not only were they, you know, parents to the same kid, they went through so much together. Like they're, there are very few people other than each other to themselves that understand the trials they went through. Like, yeah. especially at this point in the apocalypse, how many people are fulcrum trained anymore that still exist that they'll interact with. And then all the things that they just went on personally with their journey together. And just, yeah. Mm -hmm. I do think people were more chill when they found out that he started the end of the world than I expected them to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, are you going to piss off the guy who started the end of the world? <laughs> I, I'm just saying, I don't know. Like, I just felt like people were more chill about it. Like, I expected mm -hmm. someone to, to say at least choice words. I don't know. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, was it widely known that he couldn't do a Rajini anymore? Because I felt like if it was widely known that he couldn't do a Rajini, there would have been there would have been issues. As no, no, I mean, no one knew what was happening to him and he kept it kind of hidden. Like he showed yeah. that he could turn off the building. <laughs> so. yeah. But I don't know if I saw the guy who started the end of the world, just like out at the Starbucks or whatever, I wouldn't say anything either. <laughs> I mean, I guess it, like, I, I don't remember what was Essun's response when she found out even like I can't even remember what she said because she would have said something right I just I thought she was angry. I remember being like why would you do this yeah, yeah it's just like this is I don't it, it was it it felt like you did something but you didn't think it through yeah, <laughs> yeah. and TBH I'm kind of before I was like what no and now I'm like no yeah I don't know if you really thought this not this through <laughs> Well, I guess he did. He did whatever he needed to do to bring the, what, the moon back? Or Wait, was yeah. the moon always going to come back around? Or did he need to do was, the Orion? He had to ch change a trajectory, and that's part of why yeah. he made the rift to have the energy to do that. But, like, oh, if I did this, really? if, if I had this this plan, yeah, that's kind of why he made the rift. Also, he was just pissed at, like, society. But it was a happy coincidence. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. But so if I had this plan, though, me, if I this was my plan and I've had years, like a decade to think about this plan, I would first find Essun and make sure True. she could do her part of the plan. All right. True. And can then train her while I could still do it. Like maybe he doesn't know he'll be in like incapacitated, you know, like maybe he didn't know that. But I would still like if it's a two part plan. And my second part's dependent on other people. I would check in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do we know what started him on this plane? Did he just like, was he just reading stuff and he found out about it? I thought it was also kind of like the stone eater had popped up and was like, hey, did you know you could put a big rift in the earth funny. and bring back the moon? I think I the think stone eaters funny. kind of put the idea in his head. That's yeah. what I got. So I, I, I kind of got the feeling that he was like also instigated to it a little bit. So there wasn't a whole lot of like he had the skills to do it, but I got the feeling it wasn't like a whole lot of planning on his end though. But also I guess it would have made more sense to me if it happened right like after he was healed. Like I know he had to take time to like heal or whatever after Miav for whatever reason. Oh, right, using that. But like this was like a decade. So that's a long time to keep the level of passion required for an unplanned plan, you know? Like, <laughs> like that's 10 years. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> To just be like, all right, I'm bored sitting here. We've talked about the moon. I guess I'll go do something about it and just like. Mm. I mean, but that's also perfectly in line with his character. It just doesn't mean I like it. Mm. You thought he could play. Do we, do we ever figure out what he did to the Guardian? He healed he her. He implied this book that what Nasoon would have done to Shafa is what he did to his Guardian. I thought but, like, do we get into the details of that? Do we do you know if we get a flashback in the third book? I don't remember if we get a flashback in the third book. I just know on this reread when I was reading it and Nessun was talking about I can fix you, Shafa, I can remove this thing, and Shafa's remembering how he met and killed that other guardian that was old, and he's like, I'll just become old. I don't want to become old. So oh. I assume oh, okay, that okay. there was a connection in the methods. 
Got it. Especially since both knew magic. So that's what my assumptions are. Okay. My um, thing is like um, Alabaster did it because in the infirmary, Essen was like, uh, you killed your guardian. He was like, I didn't kill her. I healed her. So I was yeah. just like, yeah. Yeah, well, it was ever know. direct, you but know, like there was a lot of slippery things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, what I don't remember if we get answers to, and what I hope we get answers to, is like who started the guardians. Like that's a thing I can't yeah. remember. Oh right, because it's all automated, right? By the time that Shafa joins, like I thought there were a whole lot of people involved. Like they find him, they put him in the chair, but like no one can perform the procedure. They said that it was modified somehow from its original purpose. Yeah, um, I remember that being said. And then, like, also they live for hundreds of years. And, like, when a season happens, they're supposed to, like, go away and then come back after the season. Yeah, they just kind of hibernate or something. So, yeah. Um, and I mean, I hope we get those answers. I think we do, but I cannot remember. So, for me, that's, like, currently in reread mode. I'm, like, very excited and hopeful. Yeah. So, yeah. Is that it? So, oh, wait, you said it was Alabaster was your favorite. Oh, I don't know who my favorite is. Oh, sorry. I mean, so for Sophia's favorite part, um, yeah. I, yeah, I know you had said Alabaster, that's how we got on this topic. Yeah. I think my favorite dynamic is probably Essen and Nassim, because it's very heartbreaking. Like, um, it's just like, because you, I don't know, Essen did bad things, and I'm like, but, but she loves Nassim, and she would... Nassin's probably just so well taken care of, and Nassin's like, my mom was trash. <laughs> I don't care for my mom at all. Yeah. So, yeah. It was it was definitely like a very nuanced take on like like a, an abusive parent model, you know, like yeah. like on one hand, right? Like she, there, we're in a system that literally would kill Nassun if you know her mom wasn't as harsh on her. But also mm -hmm. it's implied that Asun realizes she was too harsh and was gonna go easier on Uche. So like there was yeah, some yeah, learning yeah. curve there. And she yeah. said she was gonna apologize. She was just like, I was gonna apologize to her when she got older, when she understood. And it's like, oh, she knows. She knows she messed up. Yeah, like, like, the whole thing. Go ahead. They, they, they require a lot of family therapy to get through yeah. this mess. That's a requirement. It's so crazy because in the first book, I was rooting for Essun, like 100%. I was like, she needs to find her daughter. And then we get Nassim's perspective and she's just like, I was trying to run away from my mom. Like, I I want nothing to do with her. And I'm just like, wow. Oh yeah, that, she was young. She was like, what, ten, like eight or something. She something. was like she's nine. Like, I want to get a job where I can yeah. live here. I don't have to be with my mom. Yeah. I like kind of, I mean, Imagine the story where in the first book, Nasun does end up in Castrima and Yika becomes like a mentor mom figure for her. It'd be so nice. Because I feel like, I don't know, I feel like Nasun's gotten the short end on a lot of parental figures in this book so far. <laughs> <laughs> like all of them. Like as much as I'm like, I guess the Shafa apologist here, it's not nice. like he's fantastic. <laughs> he's just not the worst. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'll catch up on some of the comments. Um, Jessica, I think this is for what's your favorite part. Um, description of the visuals of the magic was so cool. How did I remember they talked about looking at cells and like essence squicked out because they're like jelly like and fluid. Yeah. Like the work with the rock, but then there's like what the traces of silver everywhere is how the magic's described. Yeah, I always um, think, I think silver is like a word that's used a lot. So. Mm -hmm. uh, OMG, that scene made me so sad. I think that was about the rings. Um, it could be any scene. True. <laughs> uh, Nassim cooked her father. That showdown was powerful because mm -hmm. she knew she had ish to do and I had to see her father want to live or say stuck and stupid. <laughs> well, we know what decision he made. Um, this is about, I think, was it Alabaster and Essen? I love their love because it's mentor, apprentice, brother, sister, sister, brother, spouse, co parent. It's a lot. It is a yeah. lot. Yeah. Um, so, favorite part for Salter, Shafa and Nassen, Nassen for me because he is perfect, abusive parent, coddling, grandparent energy. People will be looking at their parents like, what is this person? Yeah. I was thinking that, yeah. <laughs> I know Salter said that a couple of times. I don't know. I think that's why I don't like or trust Shafa. I'm like, this is so convenient. Like, 
you don't have to talk to anyone that you screwed over. We don't have to, it's just, it doesn't exist anymore. You just, Oh, I forgot. I'm a new person yeah. <laughs> with these new people who don't know the old me. How convenient. I think that's why I don't like Rachel Shop. So yeah. But I still think it. like, it's not like he conveniently chose it. Like he chose not to die last book <laughs> or this book. He I don't remember. His what. calling was a guardian. He should have gone down with the ship. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, it is book convenient, but he literally doesn't remember who he is. Yeah, I know. I know he's not faking it, but still. <laughs> like, that's an interesting, like, justice dilemma, right? Like, if we had a justice system here and someone put him to trial and he literally is does not remember any of the misdeeds he does, do you still punish the person who literally has yeah. no memory of that? He would still. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, think that's justice probably justice what would yeah, happen, so but I don't think that's an drama. obvious. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. I guess for me, that's not an obvious answer because the person you're trying to punish doesn't exist anymore. What's the point of the punishment? He, he, is, he, he just, exists somewhat. He has some <laughs> of his memories. This but is he true. Also, yeah. Because he, he, did, he did eventually figure out that he knew Nastin's mom at some point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, like, for me, it's not like a clear black and white. I just think it's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, was it? Shay says, as much as Essen messed up, I think she did the absolute best she could with what she had. And I think in acknowledging the trauma she inflicted without doing the same, the system that caused it is what happens so many times when parallels are brought up to the Black community. That's interesting because I felt like there's a lot more parallels in the first book. And I feel like it's kind of died down a little. Like I felt the first yeah. book, we read all so many times, I was like, oh. This is this feels familiar. This feels like a real life situation, and like this book, it feels a little, it feels a little bit more like we're set in like a new a new world to me, at least. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. That's just like I feel like I'm like pointing to things less and feeling like oh, this feels like a a regular occurrence that I can relate to in some way. Like there's I sort of the general things, but like less of like what people are saying or the situations are facing. I feel like the parallels in like the first book were like more blatant. Whereas yeah. like what she said about like the black community, I feel like that is such a nuanced take that I personally would have never considered because mm. like trauma is generational. And so she does explore generational trauma and how like as soon is inflicting that trauma and like, you know, cause like if not soon isn't careful, she might inflict the same trauma if she ever has any kids on her kids, you know? Yeah. Mm. Uh, Salter says, yeah, the worlds are more spread out, now it's class warfare, invisible strife with separations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's more like, yeah, I guess before a lot of the book was in like the regular times and now it's a lot more like survival stuff and like, yeah, yeah. more like fantasy struggles, I guess. Um, yeah. A lot of definition of what is a person, what gives a person rights. Yeah, I mean, I think like the most, the most like, oh, like this feel like a reference, like a historical moment thing was a, was when um, Essen was like, we're not voting on who, who's a person. We're not voting on who gets kicked yeah. out. Um, and yeah. also with that Hoa, cause like Hoa was like, do you consider yourself a person? And she was just like, technically, and he's just like, forget the technically. Like, do you consider yourself a person? She's just like, yes. And Hoa is just like, well, I consider myself a person even though everyone else might not. Yeah, I get, I think that's another interesting thing about stone eater existence. It seems like they're very solitary. Like it doesn't seem like they really, Yeah. I don't know. I guess we're, we find out more about them in the third book, but thus far, it doesn't seem like they really have like friends. Like Ho get <laughs> arrives and he's just like hissing at all the other stone eaters because they're fighting yeah. over which origin they're going to eat. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting hypothesis of what Jemison thinks immortal creatures would naturally do in a society, right? Because yeah. like whether, however they might've started out, the end result seems to be a lot of isolated individuals. Yeah. Because, like, I think people work together, and, like, they said there are people working together, but, like, Ho doesn't seem to have any stone eater friends, like, that he, he doesn't seem to miss anyone, he doesn't seem to... Well, he was also trapped in an obelisk for a long time. That's so. true. He also wasn't really in the mix for a minute, but he's been around well, He presumably for a has time. old friends, but, like, or maybe not old friends, but, like, knows of the stone eaters of his age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I guess 
so far we haven't really seen them collaborate because it seems like getting an origin is like kind of like a solo thing. Like Gray Man pops up by himself. Oh, it pops up kind of by himself. Um, is Gray Man I feel the like same one? Sorry? Is Gray Man the same one that goes to Nasum and she yeah. calls him Theo? Because yeah. like, I was just like, he, I don't, I don't like his vibes. They're pitting mother against daughter. I don't, I don't know. I don't, okay, continue. Yeah, they're the same one. No, no, that's a, it's a, it's a fun part of the end of the book. <laughs> a fun oh, part. I'm so that's, scared. That's family therapy. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like I feel like they have to, to some extent, do stuff together because I thought there were a whole bunch of them hanging out at that big hole in the center of the world. Yeah, yeah. but I didn't think. Well, obviously, what's his face didn't really know their language or whatever, and they don't like yeah. move like we do. So, like, how they socialize. As of right now, we don't even really know how they choose to communicate, how often, like what is time to them, you know? Like, yeah. you know, like how long do we need to meet up with friends to still consider the friendship good? Maybe for them, it's like, oh, we just meet once a year. It's fine. Like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that's their equivalent of like a month. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Do you have comments? Uh, to consider that Nassin might protect Shafa from her mother now that the father is not the target. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, they also uh, about the stone news. They also split each other apart into dust, so people you know might take mad long to come back together and cross paths with you. Okay. That was that was interesting. Do you want to talk about that? Well, um, yeah, because what was it in the first book when Hoa made himself smaller? He had the little rock chunks that were basically just him that he was eating, I guess, to get back to like his regular state. That, that's what happened? Okay, what? and then in this book... I thought that was sustenance for him. I thought it was... Okay, I don't know if this is true, but I thought he was eating his stone eater form. And every yeah, time he I ate thought. some of his stone eater form, he became more of a stone eater again, out of his more humanoid... That's my theory. Okay. I don't I know if that's ever confirmed. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to remember... Cause I remember something happened where I thought she had to give him all of the, the stone. Yeah, no, so like he himself. was in enough um, oh. damage that okay. he would be healed by eating that because he had too much of himself in that bag or something. Yeah. But it, in order to heal himself, he had to then basically become stone eater mode quicker. But like an average stone eater will just eventually reform kind of like vampire mode. Like it'll just, yeah. all the body pieces will come together. It just takes some time. At least that's, I think, that's how the book is like. It. Yeah, they said they could either trap him in like the obelisk or a crystal, and then Hoa was like basically disassembled. Um, yeah. Like what missing was like a jaw. Rayman had his arm. Yeah, and a chunk missing out of his head. Yeah. Yeah. No. That was a really water. interesting scene with how hot it was and everything like melting and like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Basically, the floor was lava. It looks yeah. like Adrian agrees with me, so I don't feel yeah. crazy. <laughs> he reminds him himself by eating himself. Um, let's see, what else? So I guess in terms of like as a whole, uh, what did you think about this book compared to the previous book? I know on book two, we talk a little bit about like second book syndrome, like feeling like if it's in a trilogy, especially like there's some lag because, you know, the initial rush from setting stuff up is done, but also we kind of have to like, get things together for the third book. So like things aren't really getting wrapped up. Um, what did you think? Uh, did you think this book felt like laggy in some places? How do you think it compared to the previous book? Um, like enjoyment wise or pacing wise or anything like that? For me, um, it, I, like I said, it's not my favorite in this series, but I wouldn't say it has middle book syndrome for me and my tastes, but I do consider the second and third book, like I kind of read them kind of back to back whenever I, I do read them. Um, I didn't yet, so I have paused. I haven't started The Stone Sky yet. Um, I did read it in like three days, so I read it really fast. So I guess for me, the pacing's not a problem. Although if I think about it, it's like not a lot happens. Like there's a lot of yeah. like thinking, like there's a yeah. lot of introspection, but like it flows really fast. This time I even listened to the audiobook while reading and Robin Miles is just like, yeah, did she does she, has she done all of Jemison's stuff? Because I thought she also did uh, the city we became. I've this is the only Jemison book that I'd listened to so far, so I don't okay. know. Got it. Um, 
but I really loved her narration and like all the voices she gave people because I'm boring and everyone gets the same voice in my head. So like that was fun. <laughs> but I guess for me, I like the first book more because like there's a lot more like bittersweet moments and character interactions. And here there's, I do like survival mode, but there was a lot of community survival mode that always stresses me out. I'm like, oh no, mob mode, ah, stress. Like, <laughs> and I, I like the third book more because of the info dumping reveals. Cause I, I'm a sucker for that in fantasy and that, that is to come and I'm very pumped. For me personally, haven't read the third book yet, but I do, as of right now, I prefer the first book because I felt like attached to like all of the characters, especially when she did that situation where you think it's three different perspectives, but in reality it's the one. And like, I got attached to each perspective and like, cause I'm a character based reader. So I need that level of attachment. And then I found out it was the same person and my mind was just blown. And so like, I was just like, I love this character. I love the characters. I love the world. I love everything about it. Versus this one where like I didn't feel as attached to the characters, particularly Nassone. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I felt like there was a distance between me and Nassone's character development. And it didn't help that we got a lot of Shafa. I'm sorry, Angela. I'm it's sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's not my favorite character. I think I just like I'm the only one who doesn't despise him, which is such a low bar. <laughs> I think it's you and I, I think T as well. Mm -hmm. T Morgan is in the chat sometimes. I know that she has mm -hmm. had more nuanced feelings about Shafa. Uh, mm -hmm. what I, I, I thought the first book was like slow. Like I remember I really could not finish it during like a two hour sprint, like whatever chapters were assigned. And this time around, I was just like, for this book, I guess, I was like really like tearing through it. Like I could pretty much finish it within the two hours. Um, but yeah, it does feel like smaller in some ways because we don't have Demaya and Cyanite. Um, like it does, like I think our cast of characters is pretty reduced at this point. Um, but for me so far, when I first read through the trilogy, this book was my favorite. And I still do, I think like it better than the first one. Um, but you like Nasoon more than us, right? I don't like her. I just like she she brings more things out about Essen. That's what I like about her. That's really it. <laughs> it's bad that none of us like her. I feel like we should. What has she done wrong? <laughs> She's just a She's very bad. powerful child who's ruined in lives yeah. and doesn't like her mom who was not great to her. She's reacting completely reasonably to abuse. She is. She is. <laughs> but... <laughs> I can't I'm just believe saying, that Essen has done better in terms of like killing large numbers of people because Tiramo happened, but it's so crazy because I hated Essen Nasun in the first book. I couldn't stand her, but like <laughs> and like I when I upon reread, I'm just like, yeah, she is reacting normally. Like this is how any rational child would react. But for it's just there's just something. I can't put my finger on it. I'm just like, I don't, I don't vibe. I'm sorry. I mean, we all agree. It's just kind of astounding. <laughs> uh, Adrian seconds that the audiobook is awesome. She did a blended read and is going to keep doing that. Yeah, that's uh, what I'm going to do too. Salter says, this is my first trilogy and I'm pleasantly surprised this far. This book hasn't been a letdown. No. This is a very mm -hmm. good trilogy. So. Um... Yes. Trying to think, is there anything else we want to talk about before we wrap up? Um, <laughs> so it feels like we've all been through stuff. <laughs> I mean, I get that, but she's not like if she was 13, maybe I don't know. Like, I, I guess she hasn't had therapy, <laughs> it's an apocalypse. Like, <laughs> do you think they even have therapy in the stillness? I would be very surprised if they did, oh, I'd be shocked yeah. actually. Maybe in like Humanese before it went all bad because they even have like pop songs, so they seem to have more things. Like maybe for the leadership task in Humanese. Yeah. I don't think that. But even then, like the um, what are the, what's the what's the race that's like the strong race that everyone talks about? The Ash Sansa? Hair, the Sansa? Yeah, like they are so like power hungry. Maybe it would be a weakness to have them. Yeah. Like I don't even know. 
<laughs> that sweet nerve therapy. Uh, Pretty much. Um, I think if there's anything else we haven't discussed. Do people have predictions for the next book if you don't remember what happens? Or like I, plot points that people are just being talked about? I feel like any predictions I made, MK Jemison would be like, fuck that shit, throw it out. I'm going so to rewrite like, the books. <laughs> I remember she said she had to do that for the city we became because um, I think she had written it, I think like pre, basically just like stuff was happening where it was like, when she had been plotting it out, she was like, oh, like this will be like a twist. And then it just kind of like happened in real life in terms of like, I think, I think, was this published during the pandemic? I think it was, like, towards the It beginning. came out April 2020, so it would have been edited before the pandemic. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was stuff then with, like, BLM protests mainly, from what I remember, but it's been a while since I read the interview. In I think it of, like, might have also... To go. It also might have been related to, like, some right-wing politics stuff that, like, of course this would never happen, but then it did. Uh, okay, sorry. I think it was that, and I think it was general, like, like police plot points. I think that were kind of... I, I I remember this vaguely too, but I can't remember the specifics. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I was like, no. The reason I brought up the pandemic was I think that a lot of allusions to that were being made in marketing. Of people like, oh, there's this thing that spreads, just like the pandemic that we're in right now. Um, I guess I know what they're talking about, but that's weird. <laughs> yeah, I remember I didn't say it the first time around. I know people were talking about it and like. Just like when they're getting blurbs for the book and stuff like that. Not, I guess it's not, it wasn't a blur, but like when reviewers were kind of like doing their little. Um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. The comparison. I don't know. I don't trust those things like ever. <laughs> uh, Salter's prediction is that it will be other versus daughter. I can't imagine them having a warm arc without vicious conflict. You don't think so? You don't think so? <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> I'm very Probably excited to see your shots as they come out. He's just going to come back from the dead. And he's not going to have any memories either. And then they're all <laughs> they're all going to meet up at the end of the world. And yeah, it'll be great. Uh. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, what did people think about Father Earth so far? um do you have like really any reactions because it's been kind of background well bit. like i said earlier i think his reactions have i definitely don't think of him as a human because his reactions don't seem proportional to what a human's reaction would be or like doesn't seem to be very logic based maybe not a, it, it's a very passionate angry sentient thing and yeah. it doesn't seem to be listening too much <laughs> yeah I feel like, cause like that's how gods in general in mythology are. Like they just don't yeah. follow human logic. So yeah, cause like, because you said it earlier, it's like you need the origins to bring back your son, but you're trying to kill him off. What sense does that make? Yeah, it, it seems like right now Father Earth is in anger mode and does, isn't even trying to solve the problem. Like it's yeah. so weird to me. It's like you lost your kid and you have a right to be angry, but it's also been like how many thousands and thousands and thousands of years of the seasons. Yeah. It's like, so when do you move into the part of grief where you're trying to like come to terms with it or like find a solution? Cause like yeah. maybe there's a solution. Like, and that's in complete contrast to like Esun when Nasun's missing, her instincts were to grieve because of Uche, but then it was, okay, I need to go find the kid I can save. Like there's a problem I can solve. And so yeah. that's what she does. <laughs> like, I also feel like, cause like Father Earth, because he's such like a, a God-like entity, time is very yeah. different for them. So like his grief process might last millions of years. We never yeah, that's, know. That's valid. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's hard for me to relate to Father Earth. He's just very angry. <laughs> Yeah. Did anyone think that Father Earth wasn't going to be real? I remember the first time I read the book and they're like allusions to Father Earth. And I was like, I thought it was just going to like stay mythology. But now yeah. we're seeing like the shards and stuff. And it seems like the stone eaters known something. So I'm like, hmm, maybe this guy actually is a person. Like maybe there's some sentient thing in the earth. And not only that, but like Alabaster fell down the hole and he was just like, yo, Father Earth is angry. Oh, I forgot. He did. Yeah. He jumped in the hole, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. I don't think I expected it, but I think when that was revealed, I was like, okay. <laughs> that <laughs> like, makes sense. It's like, okay. Like, well, look at me. I, that's a common fantasy trope, right? To have like magic tied to like some yeah. mythological being. Yeah. Right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I think the thing that threw me more was that we were leaning towards Father Earth versus Mother Earth, which is mm -hmm. the more like standard personification of Earth. Mm -hmm. Which I think Jemison has talked about in blogs, but I can't remember yeah, why. Yeah, I think the that's what she said about it. Like, how do you think that would have, do you think that would have changed anything for you if it still had been Mother Earth? Or do you think your reactions would have been pretty much like the same? Or do you think the story would take the same trajectory? I know that, I, I know as a reader, it was intentional on her part and I'm curious about it, but like as a consumer of it, like an angry parent's an angry parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like. Yeah. I'm wondering if it just would have seemed like too, I don't know, matchy matchy, you know, because we have, like you said, Essen doing her thing with the lost, um, child if it would have been like too much too much it was like oh we have like another mother i mean i don't think that was the reasoning i think it had to do i'm trying to remember because it's not like really it's not like in book it's like one of her blogs where she talks about like the world building mm -hmm. and i can't remember so this might be completely wrong but i feel like it used to be mother earth and then transitioned into father earth that like earth is gender fluid and that it's this stage of anger that made it Father Earth. I can't remember if that's right. Oh. If so, I have made up something in my brain at some point. But <laughs> <laughs> Oh, right. And you've all read at least one of those series by Jemison, right? I, I mm -hmm. yeah, I, the Inheritance Trilogy, I read the first oh. book. OK. How do you think the mythology compares for you? Like, if you're like ranking mythologies of these other worlds, how interested are you in this one and this one's origin story as opposed to the other ones you've read? I feel like I prefer this particular mythology because I don't... <sighs> Give me a second. <laughs> All right, I can answer while she hicks the second. Um, I like the mythology in the Inheritance Trilogy more because it is obviously mm -hmm. more synonymous with like traditional mythology storytelling where gods are a little closer to human, but still like so otherworldly, but like you can have those messy connections and drama. Whereas this one, like Father Earth feels just like so far beyond us, which is totally fair. But like, I think I grew up growing up reading Greek mythology. It feels more close to those type of storytelling tropes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the reason why <laughs> yeah. I have like the same reasoning as you, but like, the reverse. <laughs> yeah. Because, like, I like that mystique, that mystery. And, like, having, like, the gods be so tangible in um, the Inheritance Trilogy, I wasn't the biggest fan of that. Yeah. Mm. No, I think that's totally fair because it is, like, completely different, I, intentionally so. Yeah. yeah. Versus, like, like, I think Dreamblood duology, the mythology there is very removed. Like, I don't Yeah, like, we don't really, like, yeah, in the Dreamblood duology, I don't know if there's really anything that happens that like confirms or denies that the mythology yeah. is real. It's just like very cultural. Yeah. It's part of everyone's like daily life. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I really like the origin story. Well, I think also the there isn't. I don't know if there's as much of a mythology for this one. Like where I felt like in the Dreamblood duology, we had this like concrete origin story that I enjoyed. Like this one, there's like a lot of different sources right which mm -hmm. i guess is how mythology is in the real world but i'm kind of used to like you get it from a book and this is like the agreed on story or how it goes so i thought in this world they weren't really even sure of the relationship between earth and the moon until like the stone eater showed up like some people like oh it's a spouse oh it's a what did they say like a breeder um like a like a breeding cast person or something um like they went through like a lot of different things that like the earth was angry about being lost. And then the stone years kind of came up and said, oh, it's the moon, it's the, it's the child. Um, yeah. Well, and there was also an implication that not only did we lose the child, but humans got greedy in taking too much from the earth. Like that hole um, itself, the whole like burrowing in, like something with a dead sieve, they went too far in a couple ways, was I think mm -hmm. the implication in this book, mm -hmm. which is not dissimilar to a lot of other dead earth, stories and things like that it's one of my favorite things i really do like when you you go a step too far hubris and 
and everything comes tumbling down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So wait, Sophia, why do you like your gods being more removed? I I don't know why, to be honest. I just, I don't know. I accept it. Okay. Like, it's not a judgment. <laughs> I was just curious because I liked how tangible the gods were and like the inheritance trilogy and how like human they were, even though they mm -hmm. kind of aren't. Yeah, um, so like, I think it was definitely an adjustment for me getting used to like the deities in this world. And I, I also think the, like the majority of the fantasy books I've read, so like I've read like um, the Mistborn trilogy or like Ruin of Kings by Jen Lyons, where like they have mythology and the like. The gods are far removed. Well, not so much in Rome. I would say not in the Cosmere, yeah. but. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think no, because like in Mistborn, I think it was like in the beginning. Well, yeah, Sonic yeah, when you first Control. start. Exactly, yes. and I think it's just me being used to it. I think that's what I'm used to reading, and so like reading, um, the Inheritance trilogy, it was like something for me to get used to. You know, so I feel like if I read more, I probably will. My preferences will probably change, but as of right now, that's okay. Is, yeah, no, I mean, actually, now that you mentioned, it, I think the Cosmere comparison is good because in the Cosmere things, even if it started more human, the whole point is that they take on a very strict entity and it, mm -hmm. they no longer are human, sort of mm -hmm. thing. It's it's very much like Father Earth, where it's like I have one personality trait. And that yeah. is anger. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. So I'm like, I want to see new things, and then new things happen, and I'm like a little thrown. I'm like, eh, what? Something new? <laughs> I have to change my reading perspective. Mm. Also says you don't want eye contact with your gods when you mush the kids out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Um, so that was everything I had planned. Is there any last questions, comments people want to share? I'm great. It was nice yeah. to meet you, Sophia. Nice oh. to meet you, too. Yeah, do that thing again. I always, I always forget to introduce the co-hosts to each other. I'm just like, oh, it's a booktube. It's a small place. Surely you know of each other. And then I, like, never introduce people behind the scenes. One well, day. I don't know. Even if I, you know, I mean, I see her channel, but, like, I don't think I've ever said hi in person. So... Yeah. <laughs> Um, in terms of like next stuff happening for the read along, next reading sprints will be next Saturday at 7 p.m. EST. We're going to be starting the Stone Sky. We're going to be getting all the answers to the mysteries and all the closure or not closure as Jemison sees fit. <laughs> so looking forward to that. Um, thanks for joining everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.